Um, let's, I want to do this. This is uh, actually a little fun game we did back in 2018, 2019 maybe. And some of you may have been here for it. Some of you may not have. Uh, so I want to see if you've improved because I didn't change the quiz at all from a year or two ago. And so let's see if how you do here, okay? All right, any guesses who this could be? I heard Tiger Woods. Nice. <laughs> this one shouldn't be too hard. <laughs> well, they really fixed his teeth up nicely, didn't they? This one's going to be harder. This is going back a ways. Is that Shelly Winters? No. Not Shelly Winters. Is she still alive? Uh, I don't think so. I don't, I'm not sure. Is it an actress? <laughs> oh. Not Margaret, Margaret Thatcher. Oh, wow. Well, it's totally different. <laughs> That's that whole round line. Ronald oh, oh, Reagan, yep. Yeah. Pete should know this one. That's Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein. This one's hard. I would not have ever known. The dog is Spot. Who'd you say? Charles Lindbergh. Charles Lindbergh. That's wow. correct. Wow. Who's the Yeah, Seventies TV. Presidential aspirations. Just speak out, don't be afraid. Any guesses? Johnny Carson. Johnny Carson, yeah. Dolly Parton? Oh, Dolly Parton. Oh, wow. Nice. Oh, my God. Yeah. 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 Former president. Yes. Jimmy Carter. Oh, Jimmy Carter. Well, you should have smiled and knew you know. <laughs> TV show.
Denver? Mountain Mom. <laughs> It's not Jay Leno. No, it's not Elvis. <laughs> not Elvis. No. <laughs> uh, starred in a lot of westerns. Oh, Michael. Uh, oh, no. Michael. Um, John Wayne. No, no, no. Is John Wayne. his first name Michael? I don't know. Jimmy G. No, it's not. You say Jimmy, I'm thinking sausage. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 this is the original coal miner's daughter here. That was it. Now we'll get to our on. You did pretty good. I mean, I was impressed. All right, we're going to take a look at some snapshots from the life of King Saul because it's really an interesting case study in uh, someone who had a very promising start and then just things went off the rails quickly uh, with Saul. And so... We want to look at that. I, one thing I love about the Bible, and I think you'll agree, is it gives us uh, at pictures of, of real people that are undoctored in any way. I mean, it gives us the, the good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, and we see some of the great qualities of someone like King David and also some of the horrible things that he was part of and, and, and that he did. So... Same thing with King Saul. Now, tonight I'm going to divide this up into eight groups, and uh, so some of you may be by yourself, but uh, we'll try it. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, and all right, I'll tell you what. Um, Jesse and Kathy and you four back here, why don't you be one group? We got what group here? A group we here. We don't have a Bible. You don't have a Bible. Okay. All right. So you y'all partner with. Uh, they can partner with us. I mean, we have our phones. Okay. okay. Yeah. And then another group back here. Cindy, you want to join with the whips? That's one, two, three, uh, four. Right here, down front. Five. So we're a group, just three of us. Yeah. Okay. And. Uh, Pete, you guys, all, all three of you want to be a group? That's fine. That's only six. I need two more groups. Anybody want to be a group? <laughs> all right. Here's, here's your assignment. I've given you scripture on the screen. And I want you to look up that scripture. I want you to read through it. And basically, you're going to give the class sort of a mini book report. Um, I want you to give us a summary of what you found out about this particular chapter in King Saul's life. Okay? Um, I'll take the last one, I guess. I need somebody to take this one and be my seventh group. Tell you what, uh, Jesse, why don't, why don't you let your table be a group, and then Kathy, your table can be a group, okay? I don't have my Bible. No Bible, okay. I don't know if we have any Bibles in the back. Let me, let me check. All right, so let me assign them to you. All right, 1 Samuel 9, chapters 9 and 10. So it's a lot of reading, but your group right here. All right. 
uh, chapter 13, 5 through 15. Webs, you got that? Uh, 14, 24 through 47. Judy, that's your group. First uh, Samuel chapters thirteen through fourteen. Um, Arnold's. First Samuel eighteen five through nine. You guys take that. Uh, First Samuel thirteen ten through thirty. Jesse, that's you. And First Samuel twenty four and twenty six. Kathy, that's yours. Okay. And I will, I will do the last one, 28, 3 through 20. All right, so I'll give you five minutes. Uh, gather up. Seven minutes. I'll give you seven minutes. All right. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and call time. And let's uh, press on. And Okay, yeah, yeah. All right, so let's let's take a look at our first snapshot of King Saul's life, and he did uh, truly have a promising start. Now we know that uh, right before this, the people had come to Samuel and said, "What? Give us a king. Give us a king. We want a king like all the other nations around us." But God had not led them in that way up until that point, uh, because. From the time they came out of Egypt, God had one person that he worked through for a period of time. They were not in a position of being a king over Israel. They were clearly God's leader. So it was, you know, Moses, then Joshua, then you had all of the different judges during that period of time. It was like, you know, there would be danger and trouble. There'd be the, this nation rising up against them, and and they'd pray to God, and He would, His Holy Spirit would empower somebody like Samson or somebody else. Even though these guys had some, you know, some big time character flaws, they were people that God used for for a season to deliver Israel from their enemies and protect them. And then you get to Samuel uh, and his, you know, being that prophet figure to, sh you know, speak the voice of God to the nation. And they had had enough. They wanted, they wanted a king. And, of course, God had warned them against a king for many or several different occasions. He said, you don't, you don't want a king. Is that king's going to take your sons and make them soldiers, going to take your daughters and uh, have them serve in his courts, you're going to take your animals and tax you and this and that. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's, you think you want it, but you really don't, basically, is what God was trying to tell them. And they insisted, and Samuel was angry, but God said, listen, don't worry about it. They didn't reject you. They're rejecting me. And so give them a king. And so he says, I'll tell you who that is to be. And so Saul is this guy. Saul is the one who the, the scripture literally says he's head and shoulders taller than anyone else. He's handsome. He's, uh, you know, probably very charismatic. And he was a humble guy at this point. So... Uh, you guys had uh, 1 Samuel chapters 9 through 10. How would you characterize Samuel at, I mean Saul at this point? Probably quiet. It says that, it says that he was not a man among the people of Israel. But he was more handsome than, than everyone. He was more handsome than he was. He was probably quite humble. Uh, yeah, very very quiet and humble he you know says you know my tribe is the least right. tribe in Israel why would God choose me uh, and it all started when he was going after some donkeys right yeah, he lost donkeys and he just kept going from one city to another city to another city finally he got to the point where his 
too far. I mean, I think it's too far. He was worried that his dad would be worried. And yeah. then his servant said, well, there's a prophet in this town. Let's go see him. And, see what he's and so at that point, Samuel anoints Saul to be the first king of Israel. And uh, like I said, a very promising start. I mean, this, he was a great guy. I mean, a, uh, it seemed like a great candidate. Let's take a look at snapshot number two. A forbidden role. specifically those verses, right? Yeah. All right, so we'll get to you, but they're going to take a little snippet of what you studied and expound on it. What, what I see here is that the Philistines have come, and basically the Israelites are in so much fear because it literally says that the soldiers of the Philistines were as many as the sands on the shore, and they got full of fear and scared, and they hid in caves, and they were quivering, and I see with Saul, instead of being strong leader who stands firm, who was obedient to God's commands that he was given, um, he himself was like, whoa, you know, he got scared himself um, and decided to take actions that it was not his to take, and he, he did the sacrifices that he was not supposed to do, and when Saul, uh, Samuel comes back, he says, he called him on it, he was wrong, and he tells Saul, I said, listen, you're not going to, your family isn't going to have the rule anymore. It's going to be taken from your line, and it's going to be given to anybody we know that's with us. <laughs> right, right. And so this is the first indication of, of God moving on from Saul. Uh, and so here he is. He's got the Philistines breathing down his neck. He's got the, uh, the men of Israel gathered, but they're shaking in their boots. Um, some of them are, you know, he's afraid they're going to start running back home. He, you know, even though he was king, he had the authority to demand that they stay. Uh, but here, um, he, he, was, he was timid here rather than being a strong ruler uh, and gave in to that fear. And... He offered sacrifices, right? And he offered these sacrifices that were really only something that Samuel could do as a man of God. The, you know, uh, the prophet, the voice, the, the mouthpiece of God. So he was to wait on Samuel. That's what he was doing, waiting on Samuel to get there. And I think God delayed Samuel just to test Saul, you know. Because as soon as he got through performing the sacrifices and the, the rituals that only Samuel could do, well, that Samuel shows up. And that's the, the first time, you know, that of a clear indication that he has sinned against the Lord and, and disobeyed and overstepped his bounds there. Snapshot number three, a foolish vow. All right, you guys had that. And so kind of summarize what you found out there. Well, the, the men of Israel had been fighting, and at the uh, Saul gave an oath to the people. He said, Cursed be the man who eats food until it is evening, and I am avenged on my enemies. So none of the people were tasting any food, but Jonathan had not heard the vow. And as the people are entering into this wooded area, they see that there, there has been beehives and there's honey on the ground, and honey uh, is easily available, but nobody touches it. But Jonathan comes, and he had not heard the vow, so he puts his staff into the honey and tastes it, and then he feels refreshed and his eyes are bright because he had some nourishment, but none of the other people uh, tasted anything. Now, they were weak, but they fought, but they could, 
couldn't fight as well as if they had eaten it. So they don't win a great victory. And then uh, Saul wants to know why. And he, he has uh, the, well, not the priest, but I guess it's Samuel, to do the throwing of the stone where it's the thumen or the uh, urim, and it shows between Saul and the people, well, it's confusing. But anyway, Saul and his son were the opposite of the people. And then he says, do it again. And, and Saul was the one who seemed to be innocent, but Jonathan seemed guilty. And so Jonathan admits that he did eat of the honey. And therefore, he is guilty, but they agreed to let him go. All right, and, and first he really said, when you surely shall die, Jonathan. But the people said he didn't hear it, and uh, you know, far from it, the people shout. They said, there shall not be one hair on his head fall to the ground, for he has worked with God this day. So they ransomed Jonathan, and he did not die. All right, and so as you read through that, what you find out is Jonathan is the mastermind behind their victory because he's gone in with a small, you know, uh, like a special ops squad, you know. I mean, they're, they're going in behind the scenes, sneaking behind enemy lines, and they accomplish this great task that turns the tide of the battle. And, the, you know, these people know what Jonathan has done. Saul is not aware. And the battle is already in hand when he makes this foolish vow. If anyone eats or drinks before we're finished, you know, they'll die. And it was just a, a rash vow that he made that didn't help his cause at all. They were weak. They were, the soldiers were weak. Uh, they didn't fight as effectively. And then, you know, of course, Jonathan doesn't know that his dad made this vow. He's, you know, he gets the honey, and he admits, you know, that's I did, and Saul was going to kill his son over this, and the people said, no, you're not, <laughs> because your son is responsible for our victory today, and so it was just this great outcry of the people that saved Jonathan's life there at that point. Uh, just gives you another insight into Saul's character and his mindset, which was just not always, it was like he wasn't thinking clearly. Snapshot number four, incomplete obedience. All right, so here we go. This was Jonathan's covert operation. Yeah. yeah, okay. I think I gave you actually the wrong scripture. Okay. I'm sorry. 
what I intended to talk about there or, or look at was when um, God instructed Saul to go and destroy this particular people group that actually when you look at it that goes all the way back to the conquest of Canaan when Joshua first brought them into the promised land there was this group that had mistreated the Israelites but they never got destroyed and yeah I think so or, um, and so you know God says go and destroy everything every man woman child every animal don't take any um, spoils of war for yourself uh, they are to be utterly, as the Bible says, devoted to destruction. And that's the, the wording he used for all of those nations that were in the promised land when Joshua conquered that land. And, you know, we can talk a long time about why did God command that. But let's get past that for a moment and just say that is, was God's command. He was very specific. And rather than following through with that, Saul uh, takes the king captive, which was a common practice when you conquered a city, you take the king captive and sort of parade him through the town for people to make fun of and jeer and mock. And they took the choicest uh, livestock, you know, the sheep, the you know, camels, whatever, and brought them back to Israel. And so then Samuel comes in and he's, you know, he's, he says, I've obeyed the Lord. And he said, you know, Samuel says, well, why do I hear the bleeding of sheep? And uh, he kills the king. And, he, you know, and then, of course, Saul says, I've sinned against the Lord. But, you know, Samuel tells him at that point, you're your kingship is gone from you and God is going to give it to someone greater than you and um, it's that's I think the point when Saul begins to fear losing his power and you know where does he go how does he hold on to power and like the rest of his life was all about holding on to that authority as king any thoughts on that? I'm just gonna. I was just think, thinking too. You know, when when Saul asked him why he did that, he said that uh, that his soldiers are the ones that took all the plunder and everything. I mean, he. Okay. he so he said he didn't do it. It was them that did it. That's the book. But it says the soldiers, because he said uh, I went on the mission that the Lord assigned me, and I completely uh, destroyed the. Uh, Amalekites and brought back Agag. The soldiers took the sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord. So here is another example of him Make an excuse. being too timid, uh, not being a strong leader, that which a king would have to be. He, he certainly had the authority to, to make them do what they were supposed to do. Uh, snapshot number five, a jealous eye. Who had this? Is that you guys? Okay. So this is when uh, they get back and all the ladies are singing about uh, Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. And so Saul throws a fit because they're singing David has killed more than Saul and Saul says, well, Look at all the praise he's getting. What's next? The kingdom. It's, it's a classic case of the leader uh, being jealous of somebody under him and creating an enemy where none existed. And he's made a prophecy, basically, that he winds up fulfilling by making an enemy of David. And then David serves him and continued to serve him. It was... The, the right thing to do was to say, yes, David is wonderful. David has done his duty. David has done this, but he just... Yeah, and we're focusing on Saul and his fall, 
but at the same time we're seeing David and his rise and you know probably these poor girls in Jerusalem who made up this song you know were just in their minds saying I'm, we're praising both our king and his greatest commander you know and that's probably what was in their hearts but when he hears this you know it's that jealousy that um, that creeps up and you know, it's, there's one scripture there where he says, from this point on, Saul kept his eye on David. And so he was constantly looking for any opportunity. And of course, we see that every um, conquest that Saul sent David on, David was miraculously victorious because God blessed him in every conquest. And it just was, you know, rubbing salt in the wound every time. And God continued to do that, even when Saul would try to sabotage him. You remember, I uh, said, I'll give you my daughter if you'll go um, kill this many Philistines. And he was hoping that in the midst of that battle, the Philistines would kill David. But no, he has to come back and be victorious and kill all, you know, this 3,000 or whatever it was. And... Uh, deliver this grisly gift uh, for the king. Uh, we won't go into that. But <laughs> uh, so yeah, we're, we're seeing the, the, the fall of one man and the rise of another at the same time. Snapshot number six, an evil spirit. Um, what you got, Jesse? Um, apparently Saul was he was going to be king. Uh, and then what we started was, you know, Saul had disobeyed God by uh, taking a burnt offering that he was not supposed to do. And he did not, you know, uh, keep the command of the Lord. And Samuel was, was like crazy. He said, why did you do, why are you doing this? You're not supposed to be doing this. And he told uh, Saul at that time, uh, God would have established you of Israel, whatever, but he's not going to do it anymore. He would disobey God. And then uh, he, Samuel said he would, you know, God would see, uh, seek out a man of his own heart. Uh, just based on, you know, Saul continuing to disobey. So Saul, I guess, or I guess uh, Saul took 600 men and went one way, and Samuel went somewhere else. Stuff about swords, and they needed to have find a blacksmith. Because, you know, there were no blacksmiths around to sharpen their swords. And stuff. Because the Philistines wouldn't let them have their yeah. weapons; they had to yeah. make their own. Um, it also talks there about an evil spirit coming on uh, Saul, almost like Pharaoh over in Exodus, you know, and where God hardened his heart. And here we see this evil spirit coming into Saul. And this, uh, I believe, was indicates that, you know, the Lord sent this evil spirit into Saul. Uh, almost a depression or a whatever you want to call it there. And so David was coming in, playing his harp, trying to soothe Saul. Uh, but Saul always had a javelin, a spear, nearby. And on at least two occasions, he tried to pin David against the wall with this, this spear. And David got away from him, escaped. And I told someone out, uh, as, we were walk, as I was walking around, you know, it's almost like Saul might have been what we would term uh, bipolar. <laughs> he was just, you know, David, you're my son. And then the next minute, I'm going to run the spear through you. Uh, David, no, come back. You're my son. No, I'm going to chase you through the wilderness. No, David, you're my son. I love you. I'll never harm a hair on your head. And now I'm going to send 3,000 men after you. It, it was just bizarre. And uh, another storyline in the midst of all this, of course, is Saul's son, Jonathan, and the heart of Dave, they were just knit together as the best of friends uh, and, and just had a kinship there. And 
you know, Jonathan's warning David to get away or it's okay to stay. And so trying to navigate that, it's just a lot of complicated relationships going on here at this particular time. Uh, number seven, a manhunt. Miss Kathy, you got that? Okay. So David acted very wisely in every situation there. Uh, and, you know, these were supernatural events where, particularly the second one there, where Saul was asleep because the, it says that God brought um, a sleep on his soldiers. You know, these were soldiers that were trained. They knew they had to be on watch the entire night. Uh, they, there was a guard around the king at all times. And they would actually camp where the king was in the center of the camp, surrounded with his soldiers. And so the only way they could sneak in to get to where Saul was sleeping was if every soldier was asleep. And so God had caused this sleep to come on the soldiers, and they were able to sneak in, get that water bottle. And even his, you know, David's second in command says, hey, let's, let's run him through now. Let's get rid of him. David said, no, no, he is God's anointed. And both times he displays the evidence, the, the cut robe and the, the water jug and so forth. And Saul realizes that he, he'd been had, you know. He could have easily been taken out by David, but David had chosen a noble thing. And that just further highlights the, the depth of how far Saul had fallen, and it, it highlights the what God would go on to say, that man of after God's own heart that was in David. We see that there on display. Just amazing. He was absolutely jealous. Yeah. And Saul was fighting a losing battle. He'd already been told his kingdom was taken away from him and was to be given to another. And he knew it was David was the man. And David's now his son-in-law. Right. <laughs> Wait, did he know David was the one chosen at this time? Did he know? Well, I... I, I thought I say that I say I say that because I think it just was made really obvious at that point how God's hand was on David and all the victories that God gave him he just kept rising up through the ranks and his popularity was just you know all over Israel the people loved David then our last one this is the one I'll I was I'll share about, but the, an act of desperation. We get here, uh, this is a point where enemies are closing in. The, the Bible says that God's spirit had left Saul, uh, Saul. He was just on his own. He was. This was a desperate act. He actually goes to a witch, we call that like a medium, uh, that to conjure up the spirit of Samuel because he said God's not speaking to me maybe I can Samuel will speak to me and there's a lot of controversy about this whole episode here because you know can a witch call up 
the spirit of Samuel, you know. Um, but when, when Samuel does appear to Saul or speak to him, he tells him exactly what you would think Samuel would say to him at that point. Hey, God's, God's left you. Why are you bothering me? Is basically what he, he said to Saul. And then it wasn't long after that that Saul and Jonathan fall in battle and are killed. So uh, it's, that's a depressing Bible study. I, that's, that's some way to get, your, get you back for next week, right? But uh, oh, looking, looking at that, that arc of his life there from a promising start to this just depressing and awful end, uh, and, and it reminds me uh, about a couple of things. What can we learn here? Obedience brings blessing. Disobedience brings sorrow. And that blessing, obedience, brings multiplied blessings. So as we obey more, we receive more blessing. And the Bible even says that he will bless to beyond our generations, you know. But when we disobey, then we even cause harm to come on people we love, our families and people around us. Our sin is not isolated to ourselves. And then the fear of man is a trap. This is actually a proverb, and it really speaks to Saul's character because he was fearful of what men thought of him. And we see that in his jealousy of David. We see that in his presumption to do the burnt offerings instead of waiting for Samuel. We saw that in his uh, saying, well, you know, I, couldn't, I can't control my soldiers. They brought in all these spoils of war, and I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. And so I, he was caught up in that snare of what other people thought of him. He wanted to be the cool king, I guess, you know. He wanted people to like him, and so he wanted his soldiers to be happy and bring home the spoils of war and so forth. And, it's just he had the authority from God to do everything that God had commanded but he was afraid of the people and that's that's one thing I struggle with maybe you struggle with that too is uh, worried about what other people think of you you know and um, sometimes we come across people that might rub us the wrong way and tell us no and we just think they're the rudest people but that's probably the kind of person that Saul if he were that kind of person could have been a more a stronger leader to lead his people and sometimes those of us who are afraid of what other people think we want to cave in and give in to the opinions of others instead of obeying the Lord and then when we are in God's will he causes us to prosper. And this is no more evident than in the life of David and how he was the youngest of his brothers. His dad didn't even think enough of him to bring him in front of the Samuel at the first place. You know, always out in the field keeping the sheep. Let me go get him. David, come in here. And you sure this is the one? Yeah, yeah, he's going to, let's anoint him king and you know, but he, he behaved himself wisely. He had learned some good lessons. He defeated Goliath with, I mean, just the boldness to come out and challenge Goliath as a young person surrounded by these seasoned veteran military soldiers. And he says, what? I come against you uh, not with spears and swords and but I come against you with the armies of the Lord of hosts that you have defied this day. And so just an incredible contrast. Well, y'all, thanks for doing that Bible study. I, I caught some, some of you off guard. I, so bring your Bibles next time. I won't, I won't do you, give you that much Bible reading maybe, but 
Uh, I like to do some of that interactive stuff because I, I like it when we work together and discover things together. And that's what I want this class to be. Don't forget, if you want to sign up for any of those classes, the sign-up sheets are in the back as you go, okay? And it won't hurt my feelings if you sign up for those classes. I will be here, and when it's done, you can come back, okay? <laughs> Let's pray, and you can be dismissed. Father, thank you so much for the truth of your word. Lord, you do not uh, hide the, uh, the bad sides of any of the people in the Bible. You display it all uh, for us to see and to learn from. And there's a lot for us to learn from the life of Saul. Uh, we've all known jealousies. We've all uh, worried about what other people think of us, the opinions they have of us. Uh, we've made rash choices. And we can see ourselves in Saul. And so, Lord, help us to take the warning that's here in scripture. Help us to rather focus on being more like David and how you used him and, and how he behaved himself very humbly, very nobly in all of the ways that he conducted himself and you were able to bless him. And Lord, we know when you bless us, we can accomplish far more than we ever thought we could. So help us to do that. Help us to examine ourselves. And Lord, may we be people after your own heart that you can trust to do your will. Clean vessels that you can work through. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, thank you so much.